Hi, I'm Les Miller. Today we're going to talk about was Uriah Smith mistaken on the King of the North? And we pray, of course, that the Lord will be with us. Let's have a prayer now. Dear Lord, talking about a topic that uh, some people in the Adventist Church see one way and others see another. So we just want to add a prayer here that your spirit will be with us for another short, quick video that hopefully um, gives people something good to think about. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Back in uh, 1996 and 1997, uh, my wife and I had the privilege of being part of a project to plant a church about an hour and a half's drive away from here, Mountain Sanctuary, Seventh-day Adventist Company in Canmore, Alberta, Canada. And another great thing the Lord did at the time, he brought in a conference president from the Manitoba, Saskatchewan Conference and his wife, who had just recently retired and moved to the church. Uh, to the town, rather, and became a um, member of that church and made a very valuable contribution to the overall project. Now, I remember one time, this particular gentleman, Lester Carney was his name, and he told me a story about how in the early 1900s, there were two camps in the Seventh-day Adventist church who did not agree on who the kings of the north and the south were in Daniel chapter 11. Now, the James White had one side, the King of the North was the Pope, and Uriah Smith had the other side, it was the Ottoman Empire, somehow, some way. So the story goes on, World War I happens, people in Uriah Smith's camp, they think, this is it, start evangelizing like crazy, and then when the war ends, what Lester told me was, that in 1919, apparently, membership in the Seventh-day Adventist Church actually went down. One of the testimonies to individuals, delivered most likely in oral form, was addressed to James White, a reproof for his course of action just before the combined camp meeting and general conference session. He and Uriah Smith held conflicting views on the prophecy of the King of the North, pictured in Daniel 11, and the power presented in verse 45 that would come to his end with none to help him. White, in his Sabbath morning address, September 28th, in the newly pitched camp meeting tent, countered Smith's interpretations. He felt that Smith's approach, indicating that the world was on the verge of Armageddon, would threaten the strong financial support needed for the rapidly expanding work of the church. Ellen White's message to her husband was a reproof for taking a course that would lead the people to observe differences of opinion among leaders and to lower their confidence in them. For the church leaders to stand in a divided position before people was hazardous. James White accepted the reproof but it was one of the most difficult experiences he was called to cope with, for he felt he was doing the right thing. At no time did Ellen White reveal which man was right in the position he held. That was not the issue. The crux of the matter was the importance of leaders presenting a united front before the people. Now this, of course, provides us with a great lesson on the dangers of speculation. Some prophecies are what I like to call multi-level prophecies, and they have elements of them that are applicable to every generation. Matthew 24, great example. But a lot of prophecies, of course, are very date-specific. They're only one event they're talking about, such as the 1260 days, of course, that we like to dwell on a lot in our prophecy seminars, but others as well. And so they can only be completely, um, completely understood when they are, of course, completely fulfilled. Though people in other times may be able to get some sort of lesson out of the experience, they won't be able to figure out exactly what's going to happen beforehand 
and again, speculation can just lead to mistakes. The way I like to say it, God is only going to fulfill his word. He's not going to fulfill your embellishment upon his word. And that's a problem, of course, that's happened in every generation, hasn't it? So what I want to say today is in harmony with the quote we heard from the Ellen White biography, but I'm not really trying to give anybody a rebuttal rather than a suggestion, a question. Hey guys, what do you think about this? But you pray about it, you study for yourself. And I wonder, is this the reason why we don't really dwell on Daniel 11 in our prophecy seminars? Just in case, maybe we might make the mistake of speculating again. There's some things I'd like you to consider. I've got an old copy from the 40s of Uriah Smith's Daniel and the Revelation here. I'll be uh, reading from it a little bit later. I have read it. I have really been blessed by it. There are the vast majority of what's in here, of course, I do agree with and support and understand. And a lot of my understanding of prophecy has been helped in a big way with this book, along with Ellen White's books. The simplest explanation for the kings of the north and the south. Once Alexander the Great had done all this conquering, and he left his empire to his four generals, after a while, eventually, it came down to just two. And whoever was in charge of the land from that point on, that was generally north of the king of Judah, or rather the, the, the nation of Judah, was the king of the north. Whoever was in charge of the land generally south of the king of, the Ju of, of Judah, rather, was the king of the south. So, even though we transitioned from the, the Greeks to the Romans to the Europeans to the modern world, there's always been this kind of dichotomy. And this is what kind of what Daniel 11 is all about. Church history is essentially a repeat of Old Testament Israel's history with parallel equivalencies. Comparing the time of the judges to the time of the early church, we see no central leader, no hierarchical system. However, when Israel sinned and asked for a king, that parallels the establishment of the Bishop of Rome as the head of the church. Just as Judah and Israel split in two, so we had a split between Catholic and Orthodox. One could essentially draw loose parallels between the Protestant Reformation and the return of the Jews from Babylon as well. Now, we go with Daniel 12 and verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. I am sure you will agree with me that if current trends continue, we are looking at a worldwide civil war between liberal and conservative for the time of trouble, aren't we? On the liberal side, we have Hollywood, the media, the intellectual elites, and the support they give for all these one-issue groups, these one-issue causes, anti-racism groups, feminism, LBGTQ2+, keeps growing, environmental groups, animal rights groups, everybody who wants to change the world but is doing it according to their own power and strength, not according to God, and according to the principles of the French Revolution. And just as the revolution ended in the reign of terror, so these things, even though most of these causes seem just, when they finally do create the world they want, where everyone gets to have their own way, where there is no truth, where religion is just a fairy tale, that world will fall apart, just like the reign of terror followed the French Revolution. Now, of course, on the other side, what do we have? Conservative, traditionalist, politically motivated evangelical Christians, especially in America, the ones the media calls the religious right. So how 
do the kings of the north and the south play into this current trend? Well, let's get Daniel 11 and verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Think about this other story I read once, and if there's anybody who can help me confirm this story, I have not read Josephus, but I've got a copy here. This book is too big for me to find the actual story itself, but I heard once that at the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Romans were outside laying siege to the city, and for that period of a couple of years, as this was happening, there were three warring factions of Jews inside the city, each fighting against the other, and more Jews actually died at the hands of other Jews than died at the hands of the Romans. Now I'm wondering, I'm wondering maybe if this is the reason why we're not told exactly who the kings of the north and south are. You see, every other system of interpreting prophecy within and without Christianity, that includes uh, all the popular books you see and the, and the popular movies and mainstream churches, that includes things like people who are into Nostradamus, they're all looking for some sort of political battle. And of course, that's the theme of a lot of post-apocalyptic science fiction films, isn't it? Somehow, some way, two groups fighting against each other. And it's a principle of human nature that if your heart is in this world, if you're not right with God, when you face death, somehow, some way, you're going to engage in some sort of last-ditch struggle to get what you want out of this life, to get your own way. And isn't that what the time of trouble is going to be for the wicked? But you see, this whirlwind in Daniel 11.40, to me, that speaks of great anger, um, great fury. And it seems to me that it's kind of like this attack is going to be like the Romans outside the walls of Jerusalem and within the church, within Western civilization. Suddenly, the mainstream church is going to be led astray by this fury. And then the mark of the beast will come. But you see, this is where Adventists come into play. Our message is different. We'll know this world is about to be destroyed and we'll be offering it one last chance. We'll be saying, this is your last chance to go to heaven, to be with Jesus. And our job is not to take one side or the other in this battle, but to offer people the seal of God, to offer them the way out. What really is the seal of God. We like to show the elements of a legal seal in the fourth commandment, but really it's more than that. Our sealing begins when we accept Jesus and are born again or converted. The next step is the sealing of the entire law in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Then the Sabbath becomes the sign of the overall process. So the seal of God is really a complete commitment to him. Think about Revelation 10, 6, where it says time no longer. Now we know that means no more prophetic time. In the last seven generations, we've been in a holding pattern, waiting for the second coming. Now here's where I will read you. Daniel and the Revelation, page 505. We're going with Revelation 9, 12. One woe is past, and behold, there are two more woes hereafter. And here is Uriah Smith's comments on the sixth trumpet. The first woe was to continue from the rise of Mohammedanism until the end of the five months. Then the first woe was to end, and the second woe begin. Now again, I get a lot out of this book. That's how I learned that Revelation 8 and 9 are talking about the Muslims. But, he clearly said, second woe is along with the first woe. In other words, the Muslims are both woes. But think about it. Revelation 8.13 has three woes. 
But where is the second woe? It's in Revelation 11, which of course is the French Revolution. So how can that woe be the, be the woe that Uriah Smith thinks it is? Unfortunately, he is mistaken on this. And this was some speculation on his part. And what about the third woe? Here's something interesting. Revelation 12, 12, it's in there. But it's not really tied to any one event, is it? So this time of trouble, somehow, some way, will factor in both Islam and secular humanism, which is what the French Revolution turned into. It's not tied to either prophetic event. Let me give you an example of the holding pattern we've been in. You know from the story of Josiah Litch and his interpretation, very similar to Uriah Smith's about Revelation 8 and 9, that August 11th, 1840, was the day the Ottoman Empire essentially ceased to exist. It lost its power in a practical way. It didn't actually cease to exist until the 1920s. And what was happening just as the Ottoman Empire was fully fading away? Communism rose in the Soviet Union. And what happened after the Soviet Union broke up? We had the Gulf War, and now with the presence of American troops on Arabian soil, Osama bin Laden and others like him see it as some sort of abomination, some sort of fulfillment of Muslim end time prophecy, and they decide they want to put every American to death. And then what happened after Osama bin Laden was killed? Suddenly Russia, still under somewhat of an anti-American influence from the communist era, doesn't want to be our friend anymore to the West. Well, do you see what I mean? The West has always had one enemy to face, but it's flipped back and forth between radical Islam and communism. But here's where I want to really take this conversation into a direction that I think is very important for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That attack does not necessarily have to be on the physical city of Rome itself. You see, we're not thinking big enough. But when you consider in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, some parts that we really don't dwell on that don't tie to the time aspects, but talk about abominations being determined, and a desolation, and consummation of the desolation, and the end of the war. Again, that's not really tied to any one event. But what it tells me is that after 34 AD, that land known as Israel became just normal land. The focus was supposed to be on heaven. We were supposed to follow Jesus by faith up there and stop dwelling on that land being some sort of special land. I remember when I became an Adventist, I got rid of a lot of my secular music. I replaced it with Christian music. There was one song I listened to. It was a song that I loved to listen to called, Wherever You Are Is Holy Ground. And that's true. So that land is no holier than your own backyard, which means, again, the conflict that we had in the Old Testament was taken to the next level. So it's not tied to any one country. Okay? So I submit to you, on this thought that the King of the North is not just the Catholic Church, it's the entire Christian West, the so-called Christian West. If we're going to say so-called Islamic State, the Christian West has been so corrupted by secular humanism, it's not really Christian anymore. But what is the King of the South? It's not all the Muslims. The 80% that are moderate Muslims, they're like the Samaritans, the modern version of the Samaritans. It's the radical Muslims, but it's not any one set, like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda. It's all of them together. Revelation 9, 16. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And every time you hear a news report about how many radicals there are in the world, what's the figure they throw out? 200 million. And this is the one verse that Uriah Smith had no opinion on because it wasn't applicable to his time. Remember Matthew 25, 8, the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. The foolish virgins say to the wise, give 
us some of your oil. So their faith isn't really in the Lord. Their connection isn't really in him. Their faith is more in the church. And of course, Matthew 24, 48. Two sets of servants, two sets of believers in Christ. One thinks the second coming is being delayed and begins to smite his fellow servants. Now that sounds like a mad scramble, doesn't it? As the world is ending. Trends in motion may change. I may be speculating. Wait and see. But if they don't, what we can expect is an attack from radical Islam somewhere, some way on the West, that's bigger than 9-11, big enough to make conservative evangelical Christians say, that's it, we are tired of the left, we are taking over. And how will they do it? With a Sunday law. But Isaiah 25, 9, right? I'm going to just get it out of my Bible and look it up and read it. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation.